So uh, right off the bat, I'm going to preface this video by saying that it is going to be a very different style from everything that we've uploaded to our channel so far. Personally, for me, I think this is a very, very important topic and it's near and dear to my heart, but it is quite academic. This is a presentation I gave on my research after coming home from Poland, and it's based on a research paper that I had written for that trip. It is quite academic in the university sense and it's not as light-hearted or as bubbly as our normal vlogs or dance covers but i do think it's important to address i would like to share some of what i've learned and also um where the perspective comes in is a different way at looking at certain historical documents um, that might be a little bit unconventional but it's not unprecedented i'm starting off the title of my essay and my presentation is actually reestablishing the human after photographic erasure now to give you a brief overview of what this is going to be about my research which largely centered on um, images and photographs of the holocaust and a different way of perhaps looking at them that restores some sort of power and dignity back to the victims rather than placing it in the hands of Nazi Germany and their various oppressive forces. Okay, so that's the topic of my paper. And I will apologize in advance if I do mispronounce some of the words. Um, I, I tried my best to look up the actual pronunciations, so I'll try my best and I apologize if I uh, butcher it slightly. So to start off, most surviving visual evidence of victims and perpetrators from um, Auschwitz-Birkenau and the Jewish ghettos were actually produced by the Schutzstaffel or SS. And this is a huge, a major um, paramilitary organization at that time that would answer directly to Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party in Nazi Germany. Going forward, I will shorten it to SS just when I'm referring to it again. Only a few photographs available from that time were actually produced by the prisoners or the victims out of their own volition. To reestablish the human in the photographs, we must use physical clues left behind in the photos to construct alternative narratives. And this is what I was talking about in the previous slide. Um, and these alternative narratives are not, you know, big, huge fantasies you would build up um, based on something that we don't know, right? But it, instead, it focuses on perhaps the interpersonal relationships of the victims that you can tell from the photos, perhaps forming a connection with the individuals in the photos and emphasizing the victim's humanity despite all efforts from Nazi Germany at that time to erase them. So the first thing that I will talk about is what we call the identification service. Um, and it's related to the whole idea of the photography and the SS at that time. When victims when Jewish people were brought to these concentration camps, those who were registered as prisoners to work um, actually were brought to this service and they had a series of photographs taken of them. Basically the process of photographing these newly registered victims is just another chance for humiliation, right, from the SS before the horrific abuse um, at the camps even started. This is an example of one of those photos, one such photo that they would take. Well, this one is from the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum website and it is a photo of Lina Mankolska. Now, like I said, this process of photographing these newly registered victims is nothing more than just another chance for humiliation by the SS on top of like the official like camp records um, that they kept, which weren't super accurate to begin with. But they did keep records of prisoners, um, and that's officially what these photos were for. And these are two accounts from survivors from the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. Uh, Hillman says, after sewing on the number and the triangular insignia, I was taken to the photographic studio. They sat me in a chair and took photos of me in three poses. A spring was installed underneath the chair that, if the subject did not stand up fast enough afterwards, dumped him on the floor. The subject fell over, of course, which was an occasion of mirth for, on the part of the SS men in attendance. Right? And another uh, survivor also counted that the SS would actually play a prank in which the men pushed some kind of button so hard that the woman flew out of the chair as if from a catapult. Now, 
Despite the often humiliating nature of having their photograph taken by the identification service, survivors of the camp actually demonstrate a desire to possess their own photos and even actively try to reunite some of the photos they recognize with individuals who were liberated from the camp. And I found this rather interesting because I think it speaks to maybe the nature of these photos and perhaps what uh, repossessing these photos might mean for the survivors. Another Auschwitz survivor did share that this photo archive was actually plundered during the evacuation and scattered over the camp streets. Some were identified and eventually returned to the survivors. And then you had former prisoners like Zawalski and Glapp, who asked former prisoners who worked um, in that service to help them recover camp photographs during their escape, right? And they went on to distribute the photos he knew to the individuals concerned once he was free. Um, now, just going over this real quickly, while the SS were in charge of the identification service, what they often did was they got prisoners of the camp to work in different departments. Um, so when they speak to speak about uh, asking former prisoners who worked in the service and their folks who were forced into the service, it was either that or basically you were doing hard labor, right? Um, that would kill you. Um, and there were many departments in these concentration camps, pulled prisoners um, to work in, I would call like slightly better conditions. Some of the, that would be like working in the kitchen or the laundry room, depending on, you know, and I, this is horrific to think about how clean they think you are. Some worked in the houses of uh, SS officers or uh, Nazi officers uh, at the camp. Uh, more often than not, those tend to be the Jehovah Witness prisoners. Um, and they would be like essentially housekeepers. And that was the position that's least likely to get you gassed in a chamber or death from starvation and exposure and disease and everything else that other people were dying with. Of, Anyways, I sidetrack. So for us nowadays, it's pretty much impossible to fully understand why these photos were of such importance to the prisoners, um, because we just don't have the same, we don't come from the same background, we don't have the same experiences, right? But one way I would suggest maybe approaching, or I think perhaps, maybe it speaks to, even on an unconscious level, um, how these former prisoners of Auschwitz want to reclaim their identities through the photographs that were produced without their consent for and by the SS for the camp's purposes. By reclaiming them, they're now repurposing them for their own purposes, not for the camp. And I think these actions reflect the first step of active resistance against the symbolic violence that was inflicted upon those registered in the camp during their arrival. Um, and I say symbolic violence because it was, you know, I can go on and on about the actual physical violence that did happen to the victims, but for the purposes of this presentation essay, I will focus on symbolic violence. What is being done nowadays? Well, we have researchers and teams such as Teresa Emil Polin, uh, who recognize the importance of this work that was initially started by the survivors, right? Um, there are actually 2,400 anonymous photographs in the archives of the State Museum of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Researchers like Teresa have stated that the goal was clear to not let anyone disappear without a name, most of the people depicting these photographs do not have a gravestone, and so therefore her work or their work aimed to restore the names to their rightful owners and actually add the privilege of speaking with Teresa and having dinner with her and her children and her family. They're absolutely lovely folk. Institutions like the Museum of Auschwitz-Birkenau, they have exhibits now like the Shoah exhibit, which contains presentations that aim to connect visitors with the victims on a more personal level. On the side, you'll see a picture of one of these um, exhibit. Now let's take a look at this photograph. This is from the Yad Vashem exhibition album of a group of Jews arriving on the platform of Auschwitz. So what I'm about to do right now, the way of looking at these photos and the way of analyzing these photos is actually based off of a lecture that we received um, from Dr. Jack Leo Stix. And it was, he lectured mostly on the Warsaw Ghetto back in 2017 when we were part of that seminar, um, but I'm simply borrowing his method and using it to reinterpret um, other photographs taken during that time. Okay, so let's take a look at two particular individuals. One I want to focus on is this child here at the very front, right here. Okay. And this child, he notices the photographer he has a somber expression on his face, 
almost as if he's aware of what's happening to them because these were all victims who were rushed right into the gas chamber it's almost like he knew the severity of the issue before some of the adults even knew it right because a lot of the folks back then they were lied to and they were told they were going to a work camp rather than a death camp you he's staring right at the camera you can see him you can see the he's i think the only person in the entire photo who saw the photographer and stared right at him you can also uh, garner a sense of the relationship he perhaps had with his caretaker. If you look at his hands, they're gripped tightly onto her coat. And it, this speaks to perhaps that she is a mother who's a mother, I'm assuming mother, um, but really it's hard to tell from the back. Um, but based on the clothing that everyone else is working, wearing, that is most likely his mother. So his relationship with mother um, seems like one where he trusts her, he trusts her to take care of her, he trusts her to be there for him. Um, and he trusts her to be his pillar and his rock when they're new and un they're in new and unfamiliar circumstances. So that's the first child. The second one is the one over here on the right. And you'll see a marked difference, a dramatic difference between the children and their reaction to this the second child, he's smiling curiously. He looks away, um, almost as if he's amused by something that's off camera that we can't see ourselves. And I find this very interesting because to Nazi Germany at that time, to the SS of the camps, being a child meant that both children in the photo, they're going to be headed straight towards the gas chambers, right? They have no value to them as workers. They're not twins, so they're not recruited for medical experiments. Well, I would say recruited, but you know pulled aside for medical experiments. The fact that their children meant that they were heading straight towards the crematorium. They were heading straight towards their death. But we can change that, right? To us, the their unique and different responses in the same situation is actually immortalized in this photo. And I think this is a symbolic memorial that erases the violence enacted by the SS photographer and by the SS at the camp as a whole. Right? We're recognizing them as individuals. They're not the same. We're restoring their identities. We're recognizing their differences. We're recognizing what makes them unique. Now, this brings us to a different set of photos altogether. The question of symbolic violence becomes really complicated when it comes to these four photos taken by the Sonder Commando in 1944. Now, not a lot of folks know about these photos. I certainly was not taught about them in school when we were learning about the Holocaust, nor did I know who the Sonder Commando were. Essentially, they were a group of prisoners who were selected because looked physically fit and strong enough to carry out the work of burning the bodies after the gas chambers. It was horrific work, right? It you were burning basically your parents, your families, your friends, countless other Jewish people every single day right? Um, and you know you're only spared that fate because you're able to do this work. If you refuse it, if you choose not to, if you fall physically ill, then you know exactly what's coming for you. Um, and the thing is, a lot of the victims didn't know they were headed for the gas chambers right away. They were lied to. They were told you're getting ready for a shower. This is a work camp, all sorts of things. And then when they were brought into the gas chamber, that's when they knew. Um, it was different for the Sonder Commando because they were very much aware of the fate that would befall them should they stop working or should they protest or rise up, you know, with whatever little um, resources they had against their jailers. And I think there are some people who look at these and they say, oh, well, you know, it was Jews who were doing this to themselves. No, they were prisoners. They were forced to. This was not a choice, right? This was life or death. So. Um, for a group of small group of the Sonder Commando in 1944, were actually able to smuggle out four images of the horrific events that were happening at the camp. To borrow um, the words of D.D. Huberman, um, he called these the four images in spite of all that served as four refutations snatched from a world that the Nazis wanted to leave wordless and imageless. The audience, therefore, must attempt to imagine the hell that Auschwitz was in the summer of 1944, because we have to. We must offer this response as a debt to the words and images that certain prisoners snatched for us from the harrowing reel of their experience. 
So D.D. Huberman, who researched these photos and he wrote quite a bit of it, uh, quite a bit about these photos, he presents two ways of being inattentive to the images provided by the Sonder Commando. Um, one is by turning the images into icons of horror by making them quote unquote presentable through various forms of retouching. And you might think, what on earth would they retouch it for? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. You'll be surprised. And the second one is reducing and desiccating the images by seeing it in um, as no more than a document of history. And this is similar to what I was talking about earlier with some of the other photos that record uh, recorded the experiences um, within the ghettos and at the camps at that time. So it's interesting that this is, and I think it speaks, it's valuable, right? It speaks to the importance that it's become a consistent theme. So the first way of making them of being inattentive to the photos, I suppose, is what he talked about turning them into icons of horror. So now these two images were images scanned from D.D. Huberman's book. And the one on the left is actually the original image that was smuggled out. And this was a naked, and this depicts um, a woman who just stripped down and was heading towards the gas chamber. Now the one to the right is actually one that was published, I believe, in a French journal um, a couple years later after the war. And you'll notice that there has been retouching done. For whatever reason, they thought it was appropriate to add breasts to make her more aesthetically presentable. I'll let you form your own opinion on that, but in my head, I just went, what the heck? Why would you do that? There's no reason to, absolutely none. And then the second way he discussed reducing and desiccating the images by seeing as no more than a document of history. So now these were the four photos smuggled out. And I didn't talk about this at the beginning, but um, it was very, you can only imagine how difficult it was for these prisoners to take these photos in secret and to sm on top of that, to smuggle them outside the camp. The quality and the angles of these photos reflect the difficult, uh, the difficulty of that um, whole process, right? In the first two, you'll see giant piles of bodies of people who had just been killed in the gas chambers being burned. And then the ones two on the right are ones that didn't work out so well in terms of they didn't manage to capture what was going on. And the Sonder Commando had to do things like step away into the background, hide in the little the buildings and the shadows with trees and snap a quick photo. There was no like, oh, let me make sure the angle's right, the lighting is right and all of that. And then they had to smuggle the film out in tooth like paste um, tubes and all of that. So it was it just shows you the urgency and the difficulty of this task. When we use these photos nowadays, the, the two on the right are often ignored. Um, because, you know, some historians or some folks just see it as, oh, it's not quote-unquote important because it doesn't show, like, the burning of the bodies and the crimes that were being committed at that camp. But I disagree. I think when you crop those images, when you reduce some of the black space around some of the photos, because that's what they did often, they zoomed in on what was happening, the two photos on the left, and they cut out the black on the outside. So he calls it almost insulting, because to remove the black space is to unintentionally alter the conditions under which the Sonder Commando had to operate under to produce the images. It, it was like, there's no perfect picture. These are low quality shaky photos because of the difficulty of the um of producing these pictures um a former sonder commander member this is what he reported right he says from the very beginning several prisoners from our sonder commander were in on my secret um we had uh dragon his brother alex a greek jew whose surname i did not remember some of us were to guard the person taking the pictures in any words we were to keep a careful watch on the approach of anyone who did not know the secret and above all for any ss men moving about in the area we all gathered at the western entrance leading from the outside to the gas chamber of crematorium five alex the greek jew quickly took out his camera pointed it towards a heap of burning bodies and pressed the shutter another picture was taken from the other side of the building where women and men were undressing under the trees they were from a transport that was to be murdered in the gas chamber of crematorium five just from his account you get a sense of urgency and you get a sense of fear but when you crop the images none of that is conveyed and i think that's wrong i think it does them a disservice um, and does not recognize them for what they did for us at that time okay now 
I'm going to switch back a little bit and address um, some of the photos that were produced from the Jewish ghetto at that time. Um, so now surviving photos from these Jewish ghettos are mostly produced by the Jewish Council to document the activities. The German soldiers, like I mentioned before, shooting propaganda photos or to produce their own personal collections of life in the ghetto. It's almost like uh, they called it like soldier tourists. Um, there was a cultural document for a Hitler. It was called the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, I won't try to say the German um, title. But these were the types of photos that were taken. The victims remain anonymous, no consent for their images, and these were just placed into personal collections. And actually, there is an album produced by young soldiers at Auschwitz-Birkenau um, during one of the most horrific summers of killings. Um, and these photos just look like vacation photos. They're pictures of the soldiers you know, having picnics and going for bike rides and walking and hanging out with their friends and all of that. And it's just like horrible. To, it's hard to wrap your head around that this was happening at the same time that people were like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people were being carted off into the crematorium. Right? That's what they did in the day and they came home and had picnics at night. It gives you chills to see the photos from that album. Because of the number of photos that were taken by German soldiers during this period of time, they're aware of at least 10 of such collections. Many of these photos then went on to become like the standard photos of the ghetto. There is a problem with that. How can the photos produced by the abusers become the official records of what happened to the victims? The perspectives are so different and the purposes these photos are being used for. It cannot, and the fact that that's all we have left almost as official documentation of that time and people form their own conclusions and thoughts about what life was like in the ghettos because of these photos that were produced by German to soldier tourists. Researchers and scholars in this area have called the camera a weapon. Um, the Nazis using photography as a sophisticated arsenal of media propaganda to control and intimidate German public opinion. I'll pause there right now, but I'm sure that you can, especially given the times that we're in right now, you can think of more than just a couple of examples of media propaganda especially when now that we have social media. What comes to mind immediately for me now that perhaps, you know, I wasn't thinking about when I first made this presentation in 2017, the Black Lives Matter protests. What do we see on the media? We see looting, we see violence, we see um, all the destruction that protesters are, or I put in quotations, protesters, really they're just looters and opportunists. Um, people seeking violence and gay. Okay. Anyways, that's all we see. That's what we see in the news reports. We don't get the reports of journalists who are getting assaulted by the police just recording police violence. We don't get the reports about peaceful protests. It's up to the individuals. It's up to the people on their own social media platforms to post those because for the most part, so many of these protests are non-violent. Um, and very successful in terms of getting their message across peacefully. I mean, I say getting loosely because, you know, who knows if it's being received. But these are nonviolent protests. But all we see are the small minority of looters and violence. And then the stuff that's happening in the States right now where Trump has an own personal police force. Like what? I don't like the similarities are baffling to me. Um, and I, it like terrifies me that this is happening again in history and we're not we don't know about it. People don't know about it. People aren't seeing the footage of protesters being shoved into police cars and taken to God knows where. Right. Like, does that not sound familiar? Does that not sound like something that's happened within the last hundred years that we're still trying to wrap our heads around and still trying to <sighs> We're still seeing the consequences of it. We're still uh, like, do we forget that easily? <sighs> Back to my topic. Still photography of the Holocaust has been actually carelessly used in recent historical literature. Scholars don't, sometimes they don't bother to identify the origin of the purpose of the photo of photograph, sorry. And 
I'm sure you can see the problem in that statement. Castle, he's a historian. He wrote, who would write our history? He said the Nazis wanted to inscribe for future generations this image of the Jew or the Jews as a race of subhumans. Who will write their story? What is their story? What's being left behind? I think we owe it to them. We owe it to the victims to be more responsible with what pictures we use and how we treat these images. Let me give you some back. Uh, so who is Grossman? Who is Grossman? He took many intimate photos of his own family during their time of forced res residence within the Lodz ghetto. These photos are the product of a man who is familiar with the art of photography. Right? There is a level of intimacy in his photos that's vastly different from the images captured by the Sonder Commando. He seemed to have intended his photos to be documents of history. But perhaps we can take away something more. We can use them as history because they're f far more appropriate and accurate than the ones taken by German soldiers in many sense of. But we also get a rare glimpse of the life of a Jewish family in the ghetto. What can these moments tell us? This is a quote from Mendel Grossman. He says he stalked the streets of the ghetto recording on film the agony of the Jewish community. He these are photos that we should be looking at for their experience. Even the fact that perhaps maybe they aren't of the same quality because they were taken almost in secret with a secret camera speaks more about their experience than the perfectly staged ones taken by German soldiers at that time, right? Grossman, to fool the Germans and the police, he stashed, uh, opened the pockets of his coat and kept his hands hidden inside them. His camera stayed hidden in a coat. It was suspended in a strap around his neck. And then he was able to manipulate the camera to aim slightly and snap these photographs. And you can see more of them at the Yad Vashem um, online gallery right there. Okay, moving on to Henrik Ross. So he was a sports photographer prior to the war. He got a job alongside Grossman within the Lantz ghetto when it was sealed in, the May, in May of 1940. He oversaw producing identity and propaganda photos. Um, he produced thousands of photos that told us what life was like in the ghetto. Um, he, some of the photos he took in secret and his testimony um, at the Eichmann trial actually helped us to understand the situation within the ghetto at that time. But there was something about his photos. He captured moments that were beautiful and unfamiliar in the context of the Holocaust, challenging the visual representation of what the Holocaust is in our minds. So for the longest time, so like I said, in the 50s, when he tried to get his pictures published, no one wanted to know because these were not the iconic pictures of the Holocaust. And the messaging was not so straightforward because he produced some beautiful images. They wanted to use some of Ross's photographs but they didn't want to use some that perhaps held a more complicated message and suggested a the gray area of human nature and how in such trying and difficult circumstances, some people make decisions that are less than ideal. No one wanted to use those photos, right? And you know, it's because it brings up a conversation that's more difficult to have that forces you to look at the nuances. It's not so straightforward. Now, these photos represent the minority. I remained unknown until 1997. Um, so the difference between these two photographers, Grossman's photos of the ghettos are well known, despite him not surviving to explain them. Ross survived and even testified in trials in 1961 with the photos but he chose to remain silent on them. These were some of his photos. And as you can tell, there some of these are beautiful moments. Like a couple caught kissing in a field, a family gathering, things that are a little bit harder to imagine um, because we're familiar with the atrocities of the Holocaust and what that looks like. 
A Holocaust historian, Jan van Pelt, this is what he says about them. He says, for me and not only for me, these pictures testify to the uncomfortable fact that amongst the starving masses of ghetto inmates and the wrenching situation imposed by the Germans, there was a small minority that fared relatively well. Right? And that's uncomfortable to hear because if they were victims, how can they be doing okay during this time? I mean, and the sad thing is often when they ended up in the same place. If you were loaded on a train and sent to a concentration camp, it didn't matter what your financial situation was before that. But in the brief time before that happened, there was a difference, right? Um, Jean Van Pelt says, two generations after the Germans liquidated the ghetto, I think we're ready for the whole picture, and therefore we need every single photograph, not just the ones that are common, the ones that we agree with. The differences between the seemingly privileged and the destitute fade in the knowledge that almost all people caught by Ross's camera were murdered shortly thereafter. Like, like I said, it didn't matter in the end how much money you have, what kind of comfortable living you were able to create for your family in the ghettos. Um, a survivor from the Lodz ghetto, Roman Halter, he says, it's right to show these photos 60 years after the war. We have to express the truth. History is finally being told as it should be. And I think I agree with that. I think we need to see both sides, but we need to be educated about what they mean. We can't just care loosely use these photos willy-nilly um, in whatever way we want. The context, context has to be there. The purpose has to be there. We have to see, we have to see what life was like for everyone. And now I know I bring up a lot of it's a difficult topic to grapple with, um, and I will leave some of the books that I've read and some of the articles um, just at the end of this video or in the description if you would like to read it and learn more about this topic, um, which I think everyone should. I don't know. It's hard to come up with a proper conclusion, proper ending to wrap it all up. This is such a heavy topic. Um, but I hope this was something to th this gave you something to think about, both historically and also in the more contemporary sense, and what our job is, what our responsibility is as a human in this world. What does it mean to be a citizen of this world? To love and care for our neighbors. What what should we be doing? that wraps up my presentation or what was my presentation thank you as always for listening